Carlos, would you please turn that radio off? That man is coming on again. I don't know. He's liable to put fluorides in the water. Don't you like to be behind the scenes in showbiz? I enjoy jolly mechanism of vast entertainment networks. Hey, you know, speaking of uh, mechanisms of vast entertainment networks, you know that that uh, <laughs> that one guy. In fact, this has been said by many others. Of course, if it's said by an official guy, it gets repeated over and over again. But if it's just said by somebody just walking around, nobody pays any attention to it. About four or five years ago. I predicted on the show here that uh, people would begin to appreciate the culture of our time as a genuine culture, you know? Just like I'm sure the Egyptians at the time when they were, you know, they're putting these pharaohs away in those those great big old pyramids didn't appreciate the fact that, you know, that they were, they were doing something which a thousand years from now people would come around and look at, you know? Sell tourists, postcards about it and all, see? But... I, I said about four or five years ago, I remember, I remember the night I said it, that, uh, one, I said that, that if, 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 uh, the 17th century, 18th century was known as the age of reason, and the 19th century was known as the Victorian age, but the 20th century would be known as the age of showbiz. And hardly anybody, you know, the people listen to that, they, they don't pay anything. What do you mean? It's just coming over the radio. Who's saying that, you know? But it's, but when somebody official says it, then they talk about it. You know that the, one of the more official social, uh, sociologists recently made the statement that by the year 1985, now that's not that long from now, you know, let's face it. That's about 15 years, give or take a year. The year 1985, over 40% of the American public would be directly involved in the industry of entertainment. <laughs> Everybody's thinking about that. Well, you know, let's face it, uh, that's true, almost true of New York City now. Uh, what do you think ad agencies are doing? One way or another. And uh, so what he what he says is that by the year 1985, what with all the additional uh, technologies and jazz and various union clauses, one thing and another, that uh, there will be a tremendous amount of leisure time. And entertainment will become more important than work. The guy will spend more of his time being entertained than he will work in. So a fantastic industry will grow up to do nothing but supply endless amounts of entertainment for all the guys that are sitting on their duffs, <laughs> not doing anything else except with their mouth hanging open, watching the tube or watching the movies or, or doing something, say. So entertainment involves a lot of things. It enter in entertainment involves guys, for example, uh, building campers. Well, this is, uh, this is obviously just for entertainment. They're not... Nobody's going to use a camper for business much. It's entertainment. Uh, guys making motorboats. Guys making water skis. Uh, <laughs> millions of guys will be making fishing tackle. Thousands and thousands of guys are going to be working doing nothing but building new drive-ins. Uh, and in other words, the entertainment business is getting to be such a hang-up in this country that by the year 19, roughly 1985, that means four out of ten people will be involved in entertainment. They'll be producing a product that has to do with entertainment. Of course, uh, and so, uh, when I, when I said this five years ago, it seemed like an insane thing to say, you know. But things change fast. And I also said five years ago, if you, if you want to hear if something, you're, just stay tuned, friend, if you want to hear something really interesting. That all around you, 
people, usually people who are younger, are beginning to appreciate the, well, let's say the, the, the real texture of our society as opposed to the uh, self-conscious art texture. So, for example, a man, in, let's say in the 1930s, if he wanted to be a collector, he collected stamps or he collected uh, art, that kind of stuff. See, that was an official thing you could collect. And uh, even if he wasn't interested in stamps, he would be advised he needs a hobby. So you collect stamps. And he'd sit there and look at those pieces of paper, you know. <laughs> I never could figure out stamp collecting. Could you, George? That just never turned me on. I remember one time when I was a kid, one of the, one of the, uh, kind of the most embarrassing, one of the embarrassing gifts I got, I was about 12 or something like that or 15, and somebody gave me a stamp album for my birthday. Well, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a notebook, you know, it's a blank pages and it's got Nicaragua. Uh, printed on one page, and on the next page you turn, it says Yucatan, and on the next page it says, uh, uh, you know, it says uh, the Philippines, and it pictures the stamps. And I was supposed to be really excited about that, see, because uh, this is something that boys, especially, are supposed to do. I never heard of a girl stamp collector. I'm sure there are such, but I never heard of. Them. Uh, and, and this is the thing, boys. So I, I think, what, what do you do? And she says, well, you 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 pay stamps in it. Actually, it was my tra- Aunt Teresa gave me this gift. She said, she said, you pay stamps in it. I said, stamps? What stamps? Well, now, I, I remember that my mother always collected the green stamps that she got at the Weebold store, which she always, she occasionally would trade in for a new pot or something. So I said, so stamps? What stamps? She says, well, you get you collect foreign stamps. And here is my, I'll give you the, the second gift I have for you now. Is the beginning of your collection. She gave me this little plastic bag, and the kind you got it by in the dime store, a little bag of stamps, saying you're supposed to paste them in. Well, I pasted them in. After that, what? I mean, you know, you can't sit around and talk to that stamp book. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of it kind of lays there. You know, it, it it really doesn't it doesn't swing. You know, so uh, I guess there's a certain type though that that, that, that can groove with that kind of stuff. But I never was one of them. See, well. Uh, in this day and age, you find a lot of people are beginning to collect things which are part of the 20th century life that is rapidly changing and will eventually by the, because we're already going into the 21st century, we're not far from it, uh, will eventually be as ancient history as, say, uh, a Queen Victoria's fan. The real piece of artwork. You know, it's a real piece of history. And most people don't recognize history when it's around them. You know, they, they, uh, oh yeah, I wonder how many guys are still kicking themselves out there, old duffers, you know, for uh, throwing away a Mercer race about, you know, this car that he had, see, and, and he finally traded it in, you know, he, the, the big moment in his life is when he got rid of this Mercer race about, see, and he was able to get a Ford. Well, <laughs> you know, I wonder how many people who threw away out of the attic that their grandmother left behind Tiffany lamps, you know, old lampshades worth about $12 billion now, and they threw them out, you know, threw them out, and they could hardly wait to get out of Woolworths, you know, to buy one of these new plastic lampshades, one of these plastic globes, you know, that kind of jazz, which has always done nothing for me either. So, uh, nevertheless, uh, it's hard to, to examine your own time. So... The kid, the, a lot of kids though. Hey, uh, George, before you go any further, do, do you have a, do you have the money button there? Let's hit the money though. There you go. What's in the name? Oh, beer. Yeah, man. You're talking my talk. Michelob. 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 Yeah. When the name's Michelob, it's an unexpected pleasure. Michelob. Oh, Charlie. Michelob. Oh, well, look what you're doing for us. Michelob, the beer is so good, people don't expect you I'm to serve ready. it to them. It's an unexpected pleasure, so surprise people. <laughs> serve Michelob. What's the name of that beer? Michelob. Michelob. It's good beer. The fancy little bottle it comes in, too. It's great for throwing. That bottle cuts the air clean. You ever you seen that Michelob? <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. Well, you know... Uh, I actually, I think that when it comes to to hobbies, probably the most uh, you know you get you get psychological about these things. And what what is a hobby actually? When you think about it, uh, it's not necessarily a pastime. Now, a pastime is not the same as a hobby. 
Golf is something that you go out, you know, you spend two, three hours at, and that's it. You don't collect an old golf game you played. But, uh, no, that's true. Whereas a hobby almost generally involves the collecting of something. Now, if you're a big game hunter, uh, guys collect trophies. You know, this, uh, this is an old story. You know, this goes all the way back to the pharaohs, for crying out loud, that the, that the pharaoh, when he was being tucked away for his final, uh, you know, his final thing, when he, when he finally kicked the bucket, he would be surrounded. They put all the stuff around him, you see, that was, that were his favorite things in life. It was felt that, uh, you know, when he gets to the other world, he's going to want to have his matchbook collection and he, he wants to have, uh, you know, that great collection of yo-yos and so forth. And by the way, speaking of the great collection of yo-yos, now that's, that's a part of the whole hobby thing. And I don't think a lot of people recognize that, uh, that hobbies have changed drastically in the past, uh, 50 years or so. And in fact, the last five years. And so, Today, uh, one of the most valuable items on the, on the collector's market is a genuine, uh, prime condition, uh, golden period yo-yo. In other words, a yo-yo that was actually used during the days of the Depression when yo-yo champs stood in every Woolworth window. And they were lo- usually little Filipino guys and they had a big, uh, thing, uh, 19, uh, uh, whatever it was, 1932 International Yo-Yo Champs, see? Well, now, guys collect those yo-yos, real yo-yos, you know. There's a lot of little plastic toys around, but if you collect the real wooden Duncan yo-yo with the with the special seal, gold seal Duncan yo-yos, these things have, been, have suddenly achieved great collector status. Look at toys now. Uh, you go up and down the village, and you'll find places where they sell nothing but old toys. And, in fact, you know that the, that old toy cars, you know, kids used to always get toy cars all the time, that they sell them by the inch now. That, yes, as a matter of fact, the toy cars go roughly, this is the, this is the rule of thumb, roughly $12 to the inch, which means that if you were to buy a 10-inch toy car of, let's say, the 1929 period, 1929-1930, that thing would cost roughly a hundred to maybe a hundred to 120 dollars on the toy collector's market. Now this stuff is is in a lot of people's attics. They don't even know that the things that they've got down in their basement are are quite valuable today because hobbies have gone so far ahead of people's knowledge that they don't realize that something they've got. In the garage, for example, somebody else is looking for and would probably pay four or five, six hundred dollars for it. For example, old refrigerators, the kind with the big circular thing on top, you know, the kind you see in old Pat O'Brien movies. Well, these things have become suddenly quite valuable and people restore them and they put them all, you know, back in original condition and they use them in their kitchen. I know one guy who has a collection of old mix masters. Back in the days when they had big bowls and big handles and jazz like that. And, and you laugh, but, but as a matter of fact, I know one man out in, in Chicago, for example, who is not particularly interested in driving cars. He has collected eight Ferraris, which he considers are going to be what he's going to retire on. Well, uh, nevertheless, uh, I, I'm, I'm the, the, what I'm doing tonight, I want you to listen to this, this, cause this is, this is really going to be interesting, really. I, I, and I'll guarantee you, you won't hear this anywhere else. That a new hobby, now we all know about guys that collect old cars. This is, this is a standard hobby. We all know about guys that collect records. A lot of guys collect records. They've been collecting records probably since the very first day that records were made. People, you know, everybody has a record collection, one kind or another, which is in a sense the equivalent of our century of stamp collecting. I think stamp collecting was basically an, a 19th century hobby. You can see old Victorian gentlemen collecting stamps, you know. And the, the equivalent of our time, really, is, is collecting records. Now, I'm not talking about just plain, ordinary LPs. I'm talking about great classic records that, uh, that uh, are just totally unavailable. And this is, a, this is a wild hobby. And a good one, too. Uh, for one thing, you can hear them. <laughs> you know, I kind of like the idea of listening to them, you know. Uh, instead of just looking at them in a jacket, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing like listening to certain Bessie Smith records, for example, which have never been reissued, uh, for one reason or another. First of all, a lot of them have never been reissued because many of them have uh, what, what, of course, in that day would be, a, would have been considered obscene lyrics. 
And today, you know, <laughs> it makes it look like greasy kid stuff, but it's groovy, you know, and listen to this stuff. All right, that's that's a hobby. We know about this hobby. Okay? Now, we also know about the, the, the current hobby of collecting Americana. Now, what is Americana? This is really, you can, you can see it in the flea circuses everywhere. You know, these little flea markets that have, that have developed where, where people are selling, uh, uh, you know, such, such stuff like, uh, Prince Albert. You know, I saw a guy selling Prince Albert tobacco cans. You know, the old Prince Albert, just, just can, you know, this is, they were thrown away in the big, the guy's out there charging $2 for Prince Albert cans. Now, I don't know what you do with them when you buy them, where you put them. You know, that's uh, that's like going out and buying garbage. But nevertheless, uh, people do. So that's that's part of the that's part of the scene. You know, collecting old Coke bottles. I know one guy that's got a you know collection of five thousand different Coke bottles. And uh, yeah, by the way, he's had to move out of two houses as a result of it. He lost a wife. She left. Uh, one of his kids has tried to get him committed. But nevertheless, that doesn't matter. He's he's hung on these bottles. See, that's his thing. I'm not going to put him down. So <laughs> that's his thing. Well, now. I'm going to show you a hobby which you probably never even heard of. This is one, I'm sure. Now, the ones who have heard of it will immediately flip and start yelling and calling up their friends on the radio, uh, you know, they come on the phone and say, hey, listen, the guy, Shepard's really telling it, you know. Now, this is a hobby I'm sure none of you, or most of you, I shouldn't say none of you, have, have n never entered your mind it could be a hobby. George, please. Now, now, I'm talking about the big red one there, the red one, okay? I'll drop you at home, Sally. Listen oh, carefully. Good. By the way, do you like your new Edsel? It's marvelous. I've been driving it for a month, and I haven't put a drop of gas in. Confidentially, her husband buys the gas. But the 1959 Edsel does have an eye-opening economy story, and this is John Cameron Swayze with the facts. First, Edsel is built to be the most distinctive car on the road, yet it's priced with Plymouth, Chevrolet, and Ford in the popular price field. So you get extra economy when you buy Edsel, because you get more for your money. More size, more room, more comfort. More solid value for every dollar you invest. Second, you get extra economy when you drive Edsel. You choose from four engines that include three V8s and a thrifty six. So if you are tired of paying too much for lookalike cars, see the distinctive new Edsel at your Edsel dealers soon. You'll also find the all-new 1959 Edsel at many Mercury dealers. Okay. <laughs> now, you heard a genuine, and by the way, this is not a tape reproduction, that is a genuine Edsel commercial. And by the way, this is the general, this is the genuine WOR. Where else would you hear an Edsel commercial? This is, <laughs> this is WOR in New York. And, uh, George, would you hit the ding dong there, please, before we go any further here? In the 30s, if you had $25,000, you had it made. But if you were an ex-con with $25,000, your life wasn't worth a plug nickel. Columbia Pictures presents James Stewart, George Kennedy, and Ann Baxter, three Academy Award winners in Fool's Parade. Rated GP, all ages, parental guidance. Yeah, it starts tomorrow at Columbia Present... No, wait a minute. Now playing at Columbia Presentation Theaters all over town. You know, uh, that that new hobby... Is uh, and it, it, it's it's really not so much of a new hobby. It's an underground hobby. Is collecting objet d'art, and that really is what it is. You know, now now listening to that Edsel commercial, that was a genuine Edsel commercial you heard, and it was fascinating to listen to, wasn't it? Now, had I told you in 1959 that one day people would be collecting Edsel commercials, which I have said repeatedly on the air here, I have said repeatedly one day. People would be collecting commercials because they reflect the time far more than anything else that you can get. I would, I, I, I'm serious. Nobody listened to me when I said it. They all thought I was being funny. And I'm being very serious about that. It happens to be funny too, but it also is serious. And I'll guarantee you within a very short time, Life Magazine, Time Magazine, Newsweek will all be writing about this and I will not be even mentioned. <laughs> I will not even be mentioned about it. And uh, just like, you know, you read all about kazoos today, you know, it never mentioned me. How long have I been playing a kazoo on this show? That's right. Long before Johnny Carson ever even heard of him, he thought the kazoo was some kind of little animal with scales. You know, <laughs> they came from South America. But uh, nevertheless, uh, 
that, that one of the growing underground hobbies that has been growing really by leaps and bounds is the collection of, of what could be called post-war American radio. Now, I know this because I get letters from collectors all over the country. Every couple of weeks, I get letters from serious collectors in, in places like uh, London and Paris. Now, most people who have collected any kind of radio up to this time really collected stuff in what could be called the prehistoric days of radio. In other words, the idea of this, you know, this disc with the, a cut of the Fred Allen show or a cut of the this show or a cut of that show. Uh, and, and most of these shows were really popular before most people around, walking around today were even, you know, with it. I mean, I don't remember any of those shows. And I know I'm going to get a lot of letters from people saying, what do you mean? What do you mean? No, I'm sorry. I don't. I really don't. Uh, just by, you know, hearing about it. And that's about the extent of it. But the, the current collecting of, 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 now when I talk about, uh, esoterica. I'm not talking about the big thing, like to collect a a tape of uh, the crash of the Hindenburg, or to collect a tape of uh, uh, of let's say D-Day landings, that kind of stuff. I'm talking about day by day stuff, which is very very uh, taken for granted at the time, but gains in interest as the years go by. Now that's right. This this Edsel is a classic example. You probably heard this Edsel spot by you know there must have been millions of them on the air at the time, because after all it was you know it was a big major promotion campaign, and never even listened much to it. Now when I play it, it becomes something really special, and it does have genuine value. It really does because it's not a gag. It has genuine value because it reflects a genuine event of the time. I've often wondered, now, now, one of the most interesting, uh, here, do you want to hear another one of those Edsel spots? All right, now, we've got a whole collection of them. Here's another Edsel spot. Now, they had four or five different types. Well, like most spots, they range through a whole series of, uh, of selling points. Now, the first one was economy. Yeah, economy. See, she came and said, I haven't put gas in a month in my Edsel. Okay, now, here, see what the selling point is on this one. I can drive my new Edsel straight up the side of a cliff. That's a trifle exaggerated. You can usually get away from a light ahead of the crowd in the 1959 Edsel, but uh, climb cliffs? This is John Cameron Swayze with some eye-opening facts about the all-new 1959 Edsel. If you are fed up with paying too much for look-alike cars, then investigate the new Edsel. It's built to be the most distinctive car on the road. Yet Edsel is priced with many models of Plymouth, Chevrolet, and Ford in the popular priced field. And Edsel gives you many extras the low priced field either forgets or charges extra for. Big self-adjusting brakes, diamond luster finish that never needs waxing, wall-to-wall carpeting, and many more. Visit your Edsel dealer and treat yourself to a demonstration drive. You'll also find Edsel at many Mercury dealers. See the eye-opener of the year. The all-new 1959 Edsel. Well, if you know anything about the history of the Edsel, that was the, uh, the 59. That was before they even had a lot of their own dealerships. That's why they said, you know, they were, uh, you go to the, uh, Mercury dealer and so forth. And that, uh, that particular spot was selling power. You know, the guy can drive right up the side of a cliff with it. And, uh, it was kind of great. Now, you know, one of the most maligned cars, uh, in, probably in, in history was the Edsel. And yet, uh, the actual facts of the matter are, the Edsel was, was a quite advanced car for its day, and is, is, is a very, was a very good car. It just was one of those things. It's just like Sonny Tufts. Do you remember the late Sonny Tufts when people, uh, his career was, was ruined because on one show, uh, inadvertently, uh, probably with some kind of malice, but really inadvertently, because I'm sure that the guy who did it, I'll ask you that question now. You remember Sonny Tufts? Did you ever hear of him, the actor? Do you remember what they did with him? Do you remember what happened with him? Don't you remember the famous phrase that practically wrecked his career? Sonny Tufts. Ask with great sarcasm and scorn. You know, Sonny Tufts. Sonny Tufts? Well, that began to be a, a big thing. Went all around the country. And from that, practically from that minute on, he couldn't work. Well, I, it wasn't because he was a bad actor or a good actor. It was just because it got the public's imagination. For a long time, the public really believed that John Wayne wasn't a good actor. Well, he is. 
<laughs> whether you, he really is. Uh, uh, so, so you know, the, it, what the public thinks is quite often not much to do with what is. And so you take the Edsel. Now, the Edsel really was a good car, but somehow the word got out that it wasn't. And forget it. I mean, once the once the public thinks a thing, there's almost it's almost impossible to to cure them up. Like the real age of Satchel Page was never what the press made it out to be. I mean, they must have had they had Satchel Page pitching in the majors at 110 years old. You know, come on. <laughs> and the irony of it all was that there were many men pitching in the National League and in the American League both who were older than Satchel Page at the time Satchel Page was famous for being old. But that doesn't matter. The public wants to believe a thing; it'll believe it. Say, so the Edsel is an example that that commercial. What I'm really getting at is that, that around the world now, the, this new breed of collectors has grown up who collect things like commercials, radio commercials. Now, there's two ways to collect them. If you collect them, the uh, tapes, which are just copies of the commercial, in other words, somebody's taped it from the air or something, that's one thing. That's like not collecting the real thing. But if you collect the actual disc that was used on radio stations, then you've really got yourself something. And that's what we're playing here now. These are not tapes. This is an actual disc taken from a radio station that went up, went out of business up in Connecticut someplace, and the collector picked this disc up out of the stuff that they were selling off. Now, I got a letter here the other day from a guy who who said, he, he wrote me a long letter and said that he had something like 3,500 segments of radio shows that were currently being done and were done in recent history around the world by various radio artists and performers. He's recognizing radio as, you know, as a genuine entertainment art form. He says he's got over 3,000. And, and he says, uh, you, you'd be surprised. He said, do you know that your show, he's talking about mine. He says, do you know that a tape of one of your shows taken off the air is right now today going for roughly three original cuts of a Fibber McGee show. Now, that was fascinating, you know. It really, and, and, and so this guy collects and he, he wanted to know, uh, you know, some biographical stuff. He wanted to add it to his collection. He, cause he already had some tapes of things that I had done. And what this guy does, he's such a collector, you know, like a big game hunter will go to Africa to collect a trophy. This guy will go to a city on his vacation to record off the air a the work, the example of a work of a guy, say, that he's heard of for years in the collector's world, and he wants to go and get his own. So he came all the way to New York and sat in a hotel room here in town with a very, very sensitive receiver and a recorder, good tape recorder, and he taped a four or five performers in this town that he thinks will be worthy of being collected in the future. I, are you curious who they are? Who the performers are? That the collectors believe will be actually worth collecting years from now. Well, I'll let you think about it. Yeah, there are actually four of them. <laughs> yes, I, I admit that I'm one of them, but who are the other three then? So, uh, I, I also received a letter from a guy in England one time who told me that, that his hobby was collecting commercials from around the world. You know, for example, are you aware that in certain parts of the country, commercials for contraceptives are on the radio? You did know that? Not in America, but I'm talking about other parts of the world. Canada, for one, by the way, in case you're curious. So, so collecting commercials can be a really interesting hobby, uh, that, that, that says a lot more about the country and the place that you're, you, that you're talking about than almost anything else. You want to hear another one of these beautiful Edsels? This is John Cameron Swayze. At that time, if you know anything about the trivia of television, John Cameron Swayze had his own news show. It was John Cameron Swayze and the News. And he would come out with his big, uh, what, what, what was, that's right. <laughs> he had a big flower in his lapel. And he would say, John Cameron Swayze and the news. Uh, here's, here's Mr. Swayze, who was the Walter Cronkite of that period. Uh, here's, here's another one of his commercials. Bouncy, bouncy, bally. Is that your new car? Yep. 
built to be the most distinctive car on the road, Edsel is actually priced with many models of Plymouth, Chevrolet, and Ford. So if you're tired of paying too much for look-alike cars, see the distinctive new Edsel. And discover the eye-opening extras Edsel gives you. Big, self-adjusting brakes, diamond luster finish that never needs waxing, wall-to-wall carpeting, and many others. Visit your Edsel dealer and treat yourself to a demonstration drive. You'll also find Edsel at many Mercury dealers. See the eye-opener of the year. The all-new 1959 Edsel. Okay, now that, down that spot, they were selling size. You know, in the air, in the previous spot, they were selling, uh, they were selling power. And the one before that, they were selling, uh, economy. Now, hey, listen, I'll award you a brass fig the gee here with a bronze oak leaf palm. If you, you know, uh, what? If you, if you, if you, if you're a collector of this kind of thing, what was Edsel's slogan? It appeared in almost all of their ads, especially in the early part of the Edsel's career. What was the thing that appeared in all their ads? There's like a slogan, like, you know, like like uh, various cigarettes had their slogans, like uh, they're toasted and they satisfy and all that. What was the Edsel's slogan? You don't know? Well, I'll let you think about that. What was the Packard slogan? And it, and it appeared in, in all of their ads for a long time. And the probable problem that happened with, with the Packard is that people took the advice of the slogan. And they did. <laughs> what was the slogan? Okay. Now, maybe you can spot it. Uh, I think they referred to it glancingly in these commercials. You know, it's funny about commercials. I, I've done a lot of commercials in my time. And uh, I think one of the most interesting types of commercial to collect, if you'd like to collect commercials, is the commercials that, and there are thousands of them made every year, for products that never get on the market. You know, when a product... When a product is uh, is put together, in other words, somebody decides to bring out a new soap, we'll say, or something, a new, uh, usually it's a new soap or something like that, uh, they'll, it's a total thing. In other words, they don't just simply decide to make this stuff and then go around and put it in the supermarkets. What they generally do is they create a campaign, a whole bit around it, and then in the middle of it, let's say they, they create the campaign, they've got all the commercials, all the ads are put together. All the pictures have been taken with the models and the whole bit. You know, they shoot the TV commercials and everything else. They spent thousands and thousands of dollars. And then it turns out that overnight, due to something, the product doesn't get on the air. Zap. <laughs> well, all this stuff remains. You know, guys have got products. They've got, they've got, for example, when, you remember when, when, uh, when oh, for a brief period there, it just seems like almost uh, five minutes ago, Time passes so quickly in the commercial world. When every commercial was coming on with the enzymes, you remember Arthur Godfrey and uh, and uh, what's his name, Ralph? No, it wasn't Ralph Bellamy. Eddie Albert was on every night talking about how uh, uh, you know the enzymes. Then all of a sudden, uh, oh, that that just hit the fan. You know the ecology business, and bam, that stuff disappeared like a like a shot. Well, I can tell you right now that already those commercials have achieved collector status. Well, you know what's going to be a collector's item very shortly? In fact, already is. Cigarette commercials. Well, let's face it, they're now illegal. Nobody puts cigarette commercials on anymore. So the cigarette commercial, in a very short time, and it's going to surprise you how short, in a very short time there will be people around, right around your knee, <laughs> and maybe bigger, who never heard a cigarette commercial. Who, who don't know what Marlboro country was like. <laughs> They don't know what a groovy place Marlboro Country was, man, you know. Yeah, I mean, you remember when that guy used to come right along in that freight car there and you see all those mountains going by and those two guys are lighting up and it's Marlboro Country? Well, well, now, that that is already passed into folklore. Now, how many of you remember Thunderbird Country? Well, all right, where's Thunderbird Country these days? Gee, I wonder where that was. Someplace out in Iowa, I think, someplace out there, just south of Dubuque. But, uh, nevertheless, Thunderbird Country. So TV, so commercials. Now, now don't go away, Al, because I want you to hear this. I'm going to, no, you're going to hear this now. I'm going to play the last cut. Listen carefully to what I'm going to play. This is a true, and I mean a real collector's item. 
My father is nine feet tall, and he gets into our Etzel with his hat on. This is John Cameron Swayze with the true facts. His father is only six feet tall. But it's true that there's plenty of room for fathers with hats or mothers with parcels in the 1959 Edsel. It's a big car with full six-passenger comfort on a 120-inch wheelbase. Edsel is built to be the most distinctive car on the road. Yet it's priced with many models of Plymouth, Chevrolet, and Ford in the popular priced field. So if you are fed up with paying too much for look-alike cars, then investigate the distinctive new Edsel. You get extra economy when you buy. More solid value for every dollar you invest. And you get extra economy when you drive. For you choose from four engines that include three V8 and a thrifty six. Treat yourself to an eye-opening demonstration drive. Visit your Edsel dealer tomorrow. You'll also find Edsel at many Mercury dealers. There you go. Now, that's the real thing, man. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a very curious thing about it. Uh, history. This is, this is the, the crazy tricks that history plays on people. Uh, I was having a big argument today with a friend of mine. We're talking about history. You know, Americans are not very historical minded, as you know, Al. Americans are not historically minded. And they tend to be very emotional. Americans are very sentimental, emotional people. And it offends them that whatever the crotchet is that they've got going at any given time may very well be totally wrong when history finally adds its final, like for example, classic example was that during his, uh, during his days in office, uh, Harry Truman was almost universally put down by the intellectuals. This is a fact. And, and if you had said anybody to anybody at that time, you know, any of those people at that time during Harry Truman's, uh, time in office that he, he could conceivably have been one of the great presidents, they'd have thought you were out of your mind. Because they were carried away by all kinds of his accent, uh, they were, you know, millions of things. But the actual things that he was doing, nobody paid much attention to. And if they did, they ascribed evil motives to him. So ultimately, history has proven a lot of these people to be totally off base. Now, I say that can be true of any president that's in. Don't be so quick to say that Nixon is a dildoc. Or that uh, Johnson, you don't know what, what's, go, what's going to be said, you know, two, maybe 10 or 15 decades from now. There's no way to know. Now, the reason that I mentioned this is because here, everybody was laughing at the Edsel, right? You agree with that? Do you know that today, among all the 1959 cars that were produced, the Edsel is the most valuable? <laughs> You know, it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a, uh, uh, almost a pyrrhic victory. You know, it's a, it's one of those uh, kind of victories uh, uh, that that uh, is it a victory? But the facts of the matter are that if you had bought an Edsel in 1959 and kept it, that car would be worth far more uh, on the collector's market, any place in the country, than any other 1959 that was produced. It's achieved a, a great stature now, and there are Edsel clubs, for example, and uh, there are annual awards given to the best preserved Edsel, <laughs> the most rare one. Now, uh, this uh, this is a very difficult field, you know. You know, speaking of uh, of uh, collectors of commercials, I know one guy who specializes in collecting commercials only of contemporary movies. You know, every movie comes out with about a thousand commercials. And it's interesting to hear a commercial for a movie that you just saw on late, late TV and it's become an old turkey now, you know, and nobody pays any attention to it and it's all chopped up and they got the Preparation Age commercials in it. And, uh, what they said about it at the time when it came out, you know, you know how they always come on TV commercials, uh, radio commercials for movies, they always come on real big, you know, once in a generation, in our time, a great motion picture marches across the screen, Lesbia O'Toole in Hearts of Flame, yes, taken from the book, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it's, uh, it's nothing, you know, years later, it's just a nothing movie. Or contrary, uh, one of the most uh, intriguing uh, sub areas of collecting, and uh, you know you can start this hobby with nothing more than a tape recorder, is collecting newscasts. In other words, just record a newscast. Now, had you recorded a newscast, let's say, uh, and it doesn't have to be in cataclysmic events, 
Had you recorded an average newscast, say, back in the 1950s, before when Eisenhower was in, things that Eisenhower was talking about, uh, and and the fact that the Russians had put this mysterious thing up in space and we didn't have one, that would be really fascinating, wouldn't it? Well, most people don't, uh, you know, they just don't think that way. And yet, that's uh, one of the, I think, one of the weaknesses of the American psyche. And I, I certainly am an American, and I plead guilty to it, that uh, most of us are not historically mine. We don't think history has anything. Well, it can be it can be stated in what Henry Ford said. One of the most famous remarks, not the, you know, uh, Henry Ford II, but the old man. One of his famous remarks is probably the most American remark I've ever heard. History is bunk. <laughs> Well, that's what he believed. And, and yet, curiously enough, he was a great believer in history. He, he, he created a great museum and stuff. You know, anything about the museum out there in Detroit. But, uh, when you, when you, uh, deal with these things, you gotta realize that time passes. I guess that's the hardest thing for people to accept. And with the passage of time, things began to have different lights on them that they never had in the beginning. And other things which seem so great are just trivial. Other things seem so great at, at the time, and they turn out to be just, uh, you know, just paper thin. Nothing. Uh, this includes uh, all kinds of things. That it, that, that, that it has been said by certain art historians that the people who will be read, let's say two or three hundred years from now, and the paintings that will be admired two or three hundred years from now, Hardly anybody in the critical world is paying any attention to at this time. And that's a sad historical fact. It's just a, a true story. You know that during the days when Mark Twain was writing, nobody paid any... It, 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 the only people who paid any attention to his writing were the people. But the critics put him down. This, this, this bumpkin talking about stuff about rivers and guys on rafts is ridiculous. <laughs> Who cares about that? And even then, he was called a, a nostalgist. Something about nostalgia. Now, put him down and say, well, he's won the same victory that the Edsel won, for whatever worth it is, you know? <laughs> I wonder how many guys taped that Edsel commercial, eh? <laughs> That's worth something, kid. Don't let your old man laugh you out of it. Look at the stuff he's collected. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's a good way to spread cheer, isn't it? <laughs> Bring it up, George. Big, big. So long, guys.